Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 131. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. On today's show, it's going to be Listener Question Day, and I like to do this on Fridays. So I saw something and thought of you because I just recorded an episode, which was number 127, about the best credit card reward programs and the benefits of different credit cards. You remember that? (laughs) Well, this I saw in the paper. There was a Chinese billionaire who charged a $170 million Modigliani painting to his Amex Black Card, which is also known as the Centurion Card. And he now has 170 million points. How cool is that? So there's no limit on that Black Card, and it's based on each cardholder's spending on a case-by-case basis. So he bought the painting at Christie's at auction, and since he's from China, some people speculate that's because there's a law in China that you cannot take out $50,000 of money, of currency, out of the country per year. So this was a way to charge it on the credit card and then pay the American Express bill. He said that he wanted the points so he can fly his family wherever they want to go for the entire rest of their lives, which is pretty cool. And of course, he can trade them for miles or for hotels. And some people have speculated if he converted his membership awards points into one of any number of airline frequent flyer programs, he could fly 3,000 times between the U.S. and Europe in the ultra deluxe first class suites offered by Singapore Airlines, which are estimated to be a normal cost of around $17,800 per round trip. So he really worked the angle about how to get points and how to use those points. So you see, when we're talking about these things on the show, it's not just for the everyday person. Billionaires are following this as well. So I got a kick out of that and I had to share it with you. If you love learning about business and how much money the world's top CEOs are making, go listen to the Top Entrepreneurs Podcast by Nathan Latka. Just search on iTunes. It's the show with the bright orange logo. So now I have a listener question for you, and this is from Jacob. He says, Hi, Linda. I just wanted to thank you. I have listened to your first 20 podcasts, and I am a believer. I'm a hairstylist, and I give quality service for a dollar store price, and I've been pretty unsuccessful. Your podcasts have been helpful for helping me understand why. I'm developing a brand and your information has been so helpful. The next thing I do today is to give you a five-star rating on iTunes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I also want to know how to get my spouse on board with becoming wealthy. Well, Jacob, that was a great question and thank you for so many things. First of all, thank you for listening to the first 20 podcasts. It sounds like you're studying the create your luxury brand format that I've mentioned there and that you're really learning how to create your own luxury brand so you can price package and promote your way to high-end clients, which is really going to get you a lot further in your own business. I also want to thank you for the five-star rating. That means a lot to me. These ratings and reviews are everything. That's how iTunes shares our show, how they rank our show. It's really important to get ratings. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Back to ya. (laughs) And um, now I'll answer your question about how to get your spouse on board with being wealthy. Well, this is something that my personal mentoring clients have struggled with and I've worked with quite a bit. And it's actually something that I really enjoy working on because it kind of goes to the root of some differences between men and women. And without being stereotypical, but with trying to 
take into account there are some natural differences between men and women and our temperaments. I will say in general, men are more comfortable with risk, uh, seem to be more comfortable risking capital and uh, you know, taking a bit of a high flyer from time to time. Women, on the other hand, as a general rule, not always, like more security. So often the women will be risk averse. So here you've got the men that like to take risk and the women who are risk averse. And you feel like you're at opposite ends of the spectrum. So you're already at odds and what can you possibly do? Because he wants to grow the money, she wants to protect the money. So this is a very natural and normal thing that I've dealt with tons of times. So what I want you to know, first of all, Jacob, is that there are some things within women that are a little bit different. For example, number one, women have their biggest fear, which is being homeless. This has been documented that a woman's number one fear is that she will be homeless. So to her, a home is extremely important for her to have. I call that a nest, and a lot of people call that a nest, and a lot of people like to nest. So women may be fluffing their nest a lot, they may be decorating a lot, they may be doing things to make their home more comfortable, depending on whether you have children or not, that enters into it. They might be making things safe for the kids. That's, you know, something that just the whole home environment is so important to women. So I think that you need to realize that a woman very often will have as her biggest priority either buying a first home or making the home that you already have more comfortable. So that's something that I just sort of want to point out. And again, that's a broad generalization I know, and I hope I haven't offended anyone, but I have found that that is very often true. And all, also, I do believe that it's why in divorce, Often women will want to keep the home in a divorce and the men just want money to move on or whatever, but the women really value the home and want to keep the home. It's just part of our natural nesting instinct. So just realize that that's super important to the woman in your life. Number two, you need to get on a common page with what you both want. And what I find is that couples often get married without discussing any of their financial goals, particularly any of their long-term financial goals. So one of the things that you need to talk about with your spouse is what is your long-term goal? Is it that you want to have a second home perhaps when you retire and maybe winter be a, a, a snowbird and winter in the southern states and perhaps you live in the northern states? Do you want to maybe sell your main house and get a little cabin at the beach? Do you want to play golf most of the time? Do you want to go to a ski resort? What is it that you want to do with your life when you're in retirement? What is that ultimate goal that you want to work toward? Now, oftentimes, there may be two different entire opinions about that. She may want to ski and you may want to go to the beach. And obviously those are not exactly the same goal. So what you want to do is agree on what you can agree on and work on compromise on the things that you can't agree on. So if you can agree that you want a second home, but you just can't agree whether it's at the beach or whether it's in the mountains, that's a good thing. At least you've agreed on you want to have a second home, you want to save for that. Or if you don't want to have a second home and you want to downsize, if you can agree on that, even if you can't decide whether that's going to be in Colorado or whether that's going to be in Florida, that's okay too. At least you are compromising on, you know, and agreeing on something in common. So you definitely have to get on the same page with your long-term goals as much as you can. Number three, you may have one of you who's a spender and one of you who's a saver. One of you might be more free with money, the other one is more careful with money. Often there are opposites that attract and one can be one way and one can be the other way. So you wanna set your priorities for money and put that retirement, of course, very high up on your priority list. If you haven't listened to 
my podcast about prioritizing your money or my podcast about spending, saving, and investing for retirement, that's podcast number 122 and 123. Go right over there and listen to that right after this show and make sure that you're setting your priorities for money and putting your retirement very high up there. Number four, you want to agree to move very infrequently. When you're first married, I don't know whether you have children or don't have children, but when you're first married and you know that you want children, it's very important to buy a home with that in mind. What you don't want to do is be moving frequently, be paying real estate commissions frequently, starting loans over and paying fees on loans and moving costs and remodeling costs and all of those things that I've talked about in prior uh, podcasts. You don't want to be moving homes a lot. That's a lot of very big ticket, uh, pricey things, pricey money out the door. So you don't want to buy a condo downtown as a single couple. And then when you have your first child, then you move to the suburbs. I recommend that you rent when you're living downtown if you want to live downtown and buy your home in the suburbs with the idea that you're going to raise your family there if that's your plan. So you want to not buy a house for a couple years and then sell that and buy another house. You want to try to avoid buying homes frequently and really try to buy them infrequently and plan on staying in in your home for 20 years. Number five, you want to have a date night. This is something that David Bach, the author of Smart Women Finish Rich, first suggested. and I loved the idea when I heard it. And that is to go on a date night, maybe once a month, go out with the idea that you're going to talk about financial matters very calmly, not have any arguments, but you're going to discuss things. You're going to discuss what your goals are for money. You're going to get on the same page. So I recommend that you go out for dinner, have a nice glass of wine, be very relaxed, and just try and get on the same page about how are you doing? Check in with how are things going? What went well? Where could you do better? What is your long-term goal again that you're really focusing on that you both want, the ones that you've really compromised and you're, you're both hoping for and planning for? That's what you want to talk about on your date night. Number six, you want to allow for dream items. So here's the thing. I always talk about you can't just live for the future completely and not have anything that you're living for today. But you also can't spend everything today and live just for today and not put any money away for the future. You have to sort of keep one eye on the present and one eye on the future. So when I say allow for dream items, what I mean is there are things in life that you want and you want sooner rather than later, but maybe they're a little bit bigger ticket maybe they're a few thousand dollars and it's not something that you're just going to go out randomly and drop a few thousand dollars. Maybe it takes a little bit more planning, takes a little bit of, uh, you know, just, just getting the right price for it, deciding what you're going to get research on this item. Let's say that your wife wants some expensive designer handbag. And to her, that's a really important thing that she really, really, really wants. And let's say for you, maybe you want an expensive Italian bike. And it's something you really, really, really want. So these are things that are bigger ticket items. Well, what can you do? You want to have some things that you spend for today, but you also want to have some money that you're putting aside for retirement tomorrow. So what you could do is maybe you can combine perhaps your birthday, anniversary, and Christmas or Hanukkah, whatever your holiday is you celebrate, put those three gift budgets together and then use that to buy this dream item that you really want. So it's a higher ticket item, but instead of buying a lot of smaller kind of things and maybe you don't really get the gifts you want, put those together and just give the gift once a year but give it for your anniversary, birthday, and for your holiday gift. And that way you're getting something that means a lot to you today, but you're also able to put money away for tomorrow. 
All right, so that's how to get your spouse on the same page, Jacob. I hope that you try my methods. You'll see that they work like a charm. I've had people who tell me they've not been on the same page, have been married for 20 years, and we've gone through similar exercises, uh, one-on-one with my mentoring, and it's really worked out well for them. And they finally, the light bulb goes on, she finally understands him, and he finally understands her, and they learn how to compromise, and they learn how to focus on the same goals, and really get on the same page financially, rather than always opposing each other, and sort of having this tug of war over control of the money. Here's another question. This is from Celine. She says, Linda, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience about wealth. I find your podcast very educational and easy to follow for people with different backgrounds. So thank you and please keep up the great work. I wanted to ask if you could recommend the best two to three banks slash brokers slash investment services where to open an IRA. I know you don't endorse products or companies, but I hope it's okay to ask if you can advise on what you've seen working best for IRAs. Thanks so much. Celine, that's a good question. And thank you for enjoying the podcast and for your compliments. It means a lot to me. First of all, understand that an IRA, I like to describe it's like an envelope. It's simply the vehicle you're going to put your investments in. It's not an investment itself. So you put the investments inside of the IRA, like you put something, a letter into an envelope. The companies that I like are Fidelity, Schwab, and Scott Trade. You can also go directly to an investment firm, like say a Vanguard, and you can open an account, but just know that if you go direct to an investment company, you're going to be limited in scope to typically their investments. Whereas Fidelity, Schwab, and Scott Trade are brokerage firms that allow you to invest in just about any company. So you have a wider range of selection that you can choose to invest in. So I recommend one of those three rather than going direct to the investment firm. Here's one more question. Linda, your introductory jingle is horrible. Please get something more age appropriate and gender neutral. Ouch. Wow. Well, (laughs) I have to say that my jingle is very intentional. And the reason that I use this particular song, which is called Life by Becca Shea, is it's for your positivity and as an affirmation to have a rich life. I purposely chose this song because the idea is for you to have the repeating words over and over and kind of as a mantra, kind of as, you know, what I use in terms of affirmations and to repeat phrases which actually help create new neural pathways in your brain and change your subconscious beliefs. So it's very intentional on my part that I chose this song for your wealthy mindset. And I'm just lucky that Becca Shea, the singer songwriter, gave me permission to use it and I love it. And I hope you will too, eventually. (laughs) That's all for this week. Until next time, live the good life and be wealthy and smart. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.